Words cannot describe how depressed I was when I finished The Last Olympian for the first time. I thought it was the end of Percy Jackson, um, my favorite book series in the world, and it, it, was, it was gone. It was the end. And uh, it's a depressing book. It really is. I mean, it's, it's still got the Percy Jackson humor. It's still got the awesome action. But overall, this is a war, and a lot of people died. This is my review for The Last Olympian by Rick Riordan, the fifth and final book in the Percy Jackson and the Olympian series. So as always, this is going to be full of spoilers, it's more of a discussion than a review, but know that I completely love this series. It was a little depressing, this ending, but overall I still really loved it. It still had the same charm as all the other books, but um, this, this was the final book. If you want to check out my Lightning Thief review, there's a bit more in depth on what I like about the writing style and the characters. So, uh, yeah, I just, I loved seeing the characters come all the way to what they came to be in this book series, and yeah, I loved it. So first off, we start off right in the action with this book. Beckendorf lands on Percy's car with Blackjack, and they're like, hey, we're gonna go bomb Luke's ship and take out all the monsters on there. And Percy's also with Rachel Elizabeth Dare. And even though I really like Rachel, I do not approve of her and Percy's relationship. And I'm happy that kind of like ended quickly because, let's face it, Percybeth. <laughs> but yeah, so we get on the ship to plant the explosives and then some stuff starts going wrong. And then Percy ends up having to go above and then he finds himself face to face with Cronus. And kind of Luke at the same time because, you know... Cronus is in Luke's body. And then we figure out early on that there's a spy at camp. They knew they were coming with the explosives. And then <laughs> Beckendorf ends up dying because the spy gave them up. And it was just like, this is the first chapter and we already have a death. This is just, <laughs> it's not going to be fun. After the explosion, Percy finds himself in Poseidon's realm. And we figure out, you know, how the war is going with Poseidon, and it's not too well. No one's really doing well in this war on the god side. It's kind of awkward seeing, like, Poseidon's wife, and it's like, yeah, it kind of stinks that, you know, I'm a demigod. <laughs> Whoopsies. But then Percy ends up getting to Camp Half-Blood, and Poseidon tells him to tell Chiron that it is time for Percy to finally learn this great prophecy that we've been hearing so much about. And when we get to camp, it's in a really sad shape. There's only like 40 or so campers and just everyone's depressed because, you know, the war is inevitable. It's coming pretty soon. Percy's almost 16 and yeah. So we hear this great prophecy and, you know, Percy it's, is scared. He basically thinks that the prophecy says that he's going to die one way or another and he's scared and he's just... He tries to be brave and is like, okay, well, if I'm going to die, we can't do anything about that. We get Selena, Beckendorf's girlfriend, crying because, you know, he's dead. Everyone's sad. It's just, it's a really sad place. And then, of course, we get more Percybeth tension because why not? <laughs> Annabeth calls Percy a coward and he starts to think that maybe she wasn't thinking about just fighting monsters. And it's just, ugh, so much tension and sadness and it's just... Admit you two love each other, like, come on. And then we meet up with Nico again to follow Luke's path to become invincible and get the curse of Achilles, basically. So we kind of get a little more of Luke's backstory, which I thought was really interesting, but it's also really sketchy, and his mom just creeped the heck out of me, and it was nice to get a little more substance to Luke. Even though, you know, Luke always had substance, but we find out more about him. And then we meet up with Percy's mom, and his mom has to give him this blessing for something extremely, extremely dangerous, and it's just, it's so sad, really, because his poor mom has to go through so much, especially in the years of Olympus. Then we end up finding Grover, and in finding Grover, we figure out some things that the Titans are planning for the war, and so we go down into the underworld, and then we figure out that Nico tricked Percy. Nico wanted to figure out more about his own parents and we figure out about some of that a little bit later. <laughs> but yeah, just basically Nico tricked Percy but Hades tricked Nico. I just, I feel so bad for Nico because I just, 
yes, that was the wrong thing of him to do, but at the same time, like, he wanted to figure out what happened to his family. He really has no family left besides Hades, and that's not really the best family to have. But anyways, he redeems himself. Percy gets the curse of Achilles, and he takes out Hades' whole, like, army just by himself because, you know, he's all invincible and crap now. And then he meets everyone up in New York City, and it's basically like, guys, crap's about to go down. War is coming. War is here, basically, and we need to prepare for it. We go to Olympus. We see Hestia again after Hestia kind of saw them after Luke's place. And I really, really like Hestia. I think she's like one of the most mellow goddesses and she's just really important and I think you know goddess of like it's kind of a metaphor for you know home and you know protecting your home and she's kind of like a representation of that. We also meet Hermes again and that was whole confrontation about Luke and with Annabeth that was just Hermes you know he was always sad about Luke but he seemed really really sad you know and just kind of over the edge and really depressed about where Luke has gone, especially like since we kind of last saw him back in the Sea of Monsters. I don't know how many times I've said sad in this review already, but it, it's depressing. Then after this whole confrontation and stuff in Olympus, and we figure out we're not going to get any help from the gods because they're too busy fighting Typhon, we see that the whole city has been put to sleep by Morpheus, who put Grover to sleep. And then we see Percy's parents at some point, you know, sleeping in the car, and it's just, it was really heartbreaking to see him, like, go up there, like, we have to help them, like, just feeling so helpless. And I hate how Percy felt so helpless a lot of times in this book, and it was just, it was a really, really tested his strength. And, you know, basically, we get this giant epic battle we meet, many new monsters. We also see old monsters. The Minotaur came back and tried to take out Percy again and it was oh, so sad. We meet, we meet Prometheus and how he's like, you know, you kind of have no chance. But we kind of do because he's Percy Jackson. And also throughout the battles, you know, we don't have Clarice because she's too busy just sulking and being like, I didn't get my chariot. And like, I like Clarice, but oh my god, sometimes that girl ticks the heck out of me. It's like, this is a battle that we kind of need you in because we're probably all gonna die if you can't come and help us out. So so throughout all these battles, the spy keeps giving the enemy information and it's just, oh, Cronus. Ugh. The spy is just such a dick. And then, of course, we figure out that the spy was Selena. And I didn't see it coming. Uh... I guess for some people it was pretty obvious, but for me I had no clue and I was just like, what? And you know, I thought that she really redeemed herself by, you know, like getting the Ares kids to come and Clarice like had the, the blessing of Ares and it was just, ugh. I don't want to say it, but it was sad. I don't want to reuse that so much, but it really was. <laughs> and then we also see like more character development with Clarice, you know, just really realizing how dumb she's been for a lot of her decisions. And then, of course, we're starting to get to the end, and then Percy convinces Poseidon to take out Typhon, leave his own realm, which is like Ghost Rebel, and that, that kind of sucks. But in the end, it really pulls off because Tyson takes out Typhon and yeah, swallows him right back into Tartarus. And I was like, yeah! Finally, someone put the thing back where it came from, and it helped me. And then, also getting to the end, we have Cronus's showdown. And we have him in front of the Empire State Building, and he takes out Chiron, his own son. And, oh, that was just depressing. And then, you know, he storms up to Olympus, and Percy was, like, you know, like trying not to sob, and was like, Mrs. O'Leary, find Chiron in the rubble, and, like, see, like, dig him out, see if he's okay. And that was just really, really sad, because Chiron, Chiron. And then, you know, we have him up in the throne room, and he's like, which one should I take out first? And then Annabeth is trying to convince him not to, and then we just have these fights, and then we have Ethan, just overall a bunch of chaos, but then it ends up being coming down to Percy's choice to give Luke the dagger, to take out Cronus, including himself, or to not give him the dagger and have Cronus go into his full form and destroy. And in the end, Percy did the right thing, gave the knife to Luke. Luke took out himself, including Cronus. And then we have 
Cronus defeated. The end. And it was really, really sad with Luke's death, and when I first read this book, I didn't really feel too bad for Luke, but rereading it, I felt so bad for him, and it was really depressing when, you know, like, the fates are leading them away, and Percy was realizing that the string that they cut in front of him was actually for Luke and not Percy himself, and then George and Martha were just saying, poor Luke, poor Luke, and Hermes, ugh. I can't help but think, like, what had happened if, you know, Luke hadn't gone on this path, because Luke was really a really nice guy, and he just was led in the wrong direction and was tempted by Cronus. And then after the whole celebration, you know, Percy gets asked to be a god and he turns it down because Percibeth. You know, everyone gets their rewards and it's just all happy, but then, you know, we hear about Rachel who showed up and kind of helped them out a bit and was having weird dreams and stuff. We find out that she becomes the new Oracle. So it's no longer a creepy mummy, it's, it's Rachel. And with that comes the new great prophecy that continues in the Heroes of Olympus series. And then also at the end we get this nice little wrap up with the whole Percival. They're kind of just sitting and talking and then Annabeth kisses Percy and then everyone's like, it's about time, which is like the fandom. And then they get dumped into the canoe lake, and oh, it's just, it's so happy. It was a sad book, but overall, you know, it had a, a nice, happy ending. You know, people died, but overall, we prevailed. And then it just gets worse in the next series. <laughs> but yeah, guys, tell me below your thoughts about the Percy Jackson, the Olympian series. I completely love them. I give the entire series 5 out of 5. Every single book is a 5 out of 5 book. Just... I completely love them. So yeah, as always guys, have a great day, read a great book, and I'll see you all later.